With each repetition of a habit, small changes occur in the cognitive and neural mechanisms associated with procedural memory. So I just want to talk for a second about what procedural memory is. In the neuroscience of memory, we distinguish between what's called episodic memory and procedural memory. Episodic memory is a recall of a particular set of events that happened, whereas procedural memory is holding in mind the specific sequence of things that need to happen in order for a particular outcome to occur. So think of it like a recipe or a protocol, or if for sake of exercise, it's like sets and reps or a particular course that you're going to run or cycle or the number of laps you're going to swim and how you're going to perform it. It's very clear that for anyone trying to adopt new habits, Getting into the mindset of procedural memory is very useful for overcoming that barrier that we call limbic friction. How do you do that? Well, a simple visualization exercise, or it doesn't even have to be done eyes closed. You know, oftentimes we hear visualization exercise, you think about sitting in the lotus position, eyes closed, and you know, trying really hard to visualize something. It doesn't need to be anything like that. It can simply be if you are deciding to adopt a new habit, to just think about the very specific sequence of steps that's required to execute that habit. And I'll use a trivial example, but this could be applied to anything. Let's say I want to get into the habit of making myself or someone else in my household a cup of espresso every morning. I would actually think through each of those steps, walk into the kitchen, turn on the espresso machine, draw the espresso, walking through each of those steps from start to finish, It turns out just that simple mental exercise done once can shift people toward a much higher likelihood of performing that habit regularly, not just the first time, but as they continue out into the days and weeks that follow. So that's remarkable to me. And the literature is really robust. Just one mental exercise of thinking through what are the sequence of steps required in order to perform this habit from start to finish can shift the likelihood of being able to perform that habit from unlikely or moderately likely to very likely over time. And that's because it pulls from this process that involves our hippocampus and our neocortex and other areas of our brain and nervous system that engage in procedural memory. It shifts the brain towards a a mindset, if you will. Uh, It's more of a neural circuit set, it would be more accurate, but a mindset slash neural circuit set of doing things in a particular sequence, which allows that limbic friction to come down and increases the likelihood that we're going to perform that thing. Simple tool, but very powerful tool according to the psychology literature. And actually the cellular and molecular mechanisms that underlie that sort of procedural memory stepping through phenomenon are known. In this article, I mentioned this beautiful review, they talk about so-called Hebbian learning. Donald Hebb was a psychologist uh, in Canada and birthed this field that has now lasted, gosh, um, more than 50 years and is still very strong in neuroscience and psychology of Hebbian learning. Hebbian learning is when particular neurons are coactive, meaning when they fire together, they tend to strengthen their connections with one another. And it has a number of different underlying cellular and molecular features that we don't have to go into in detail, but for those of you that wanna know, I know some of you are hungry for a little bit more neuroscience. Uh, This involves things like NMDA receptors, N-methyl D aspartate receptors. NMDA receptors are really important, I think for everyone to understand. So I'll just tell you a little bit about them. These are receptors that are on the neuron surface And normally they don't contribute much to the activity of those neurons. Those neurons are perfectly capable of doing their thing without activation of this NMDA receptor. But when a neuron gets a very strong input, a strong stimulus, that NMDA receptor triggers a number of mechanisms that recruit to the surface of the neuron more other receptors. In other words, it makes that neuron more responsive to input in the future such that it doesn't require so much input. In other words, it takes a neuron that is very unlikely to fire and makes it more likely to fire. So this procedural stepping through of the steps of the recipe or the series of action steps that are involved in sitting down to study and writing for an hour or generating exercise, whatever it is, the habit that you're trying to learn, when you're doing that exercise, it's not as if your nervous system thinks you're actually performing the behavior. Your nervous system isn't stupid. It's actually a lot smarter than that. It knows the difference between a thought and an action. But when you do that, it sets in motion the same neurons that are going to be required for the execution of that habit. And so when you actually show up to perform that habit, it's as if 
the dominoes fall more easily. It's it's a um, lower threshold, as we say, in order to get the habit to perform. So heavy in learning, NMDA receptors, all that um, nuts and bolts stuff are really the guts of the mechanisms of how this works. But for those of you that just want to be more habitual about certain things, be able to perform certain things more reflexively that you would like in your life, simply take the time, do it once, maybe twice, and just sit down, close your eyes if you like, and just step through the procedure of what it's going to take in order to perform that habit. The psychology literature, as I mentioned, and also the neuroscience literature strongly supports the fact that it is going to make it far easier for you to adopt and maintain that habit. And if you are somebody who used to perform a habit and you don't understand why you dropped it and you're frustrated with yourself and you're trying to figure out how you can get back into that habit, well, by all means, lean right back into that habit. But if you're having trouble doing that, also just use the procedural memory exercise in order to shift your nervous system toward a higher likelihood that you will return to that habit. Just the same way I described for trying to initiate a new habit. So now I'd like to discuss a second and what I think is perhaps the most powerful tool for being able to acquire and stick to new habits. This tool is rooted in what we call neural circuits, and I do think it is important to understand a little bit about how those neural circuits work. For those of you that are saying, just tell me what to do, I have to say, as I always say, understanding a little bit or a lot of underlying mechanism will help solidify these concepts for you and will help ensure that the tools that I offer are going to make sense and that they're going to make sense in different contexts and for different types of habits that you're trying to learn. So rather than just tell you what to do, I'm going to tell you how this particular tool works. And then in doing that, you should be able to apply it to any habit under any conditions. The tool that I'm referring to is something called task bracketing. And the neural circuits associated with task bracketing are basically the neural circuits that are going to allow you to learn any new type of habit or break any habit that you'd like to break. We have in our brain a set of neural circuits that fall under the umbrella term of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are involved in action execution, meaning doing certain things, and action suppression, not doing certain things. In the experimental realm, these are referred to as go, meaning do, or no go, don't do certain things. And some of us fall more into the category of we find it very easy to do certain things, but harder to not do other things. Some people have a lot of no-go type circuits that are very robust and they have a lot of behavioral constraint, but they have a harder time getting into action. And some people have a perfect balance of both, but I've never met one of those people. So again, drawing from, and more or less paraphrasing from this beautiful review that I described earlier in annual review, annual review of psychology, excuse me, by Wood and Runger, task bracketing involves a particular set of neural circuits within the basal ganglia. So I'm going to describe this here again, paraphrasing a sensory motor loop. Sensory means just input coming in about sight, sounds, tastes, etc. And then the motor systems, the systems of the brain and body that generate action, taking that information and generating action. So it turns out that there's an area of our basal ganglia called the dorsolateral striatum. We can use the acronym DLS. Again, dorsolateral striatum. Dorsal means up, lateral means to the side, so dorsolateral, and striatum is a subdivision of the basal ganglia. And it's very important for the establishment of behaviors that are associated with a habit, but not necessarily the habit itself. And beautiful studies in both animals and humans that record the electrical activity in the dorsolateral striatum find that the dorsolateral striatum is associated, meaning it becomes active, at the beginning of a particular habit and at the very end and after a particular habit. Hence the phrase task bracketing, it brackets the habit. Now other sets of neurons are going to be active during the actual execution of the habit. But what the literature on the dorsal lateral striatum tells us is that we have particular circuits in our brain that are devoted to framing the events that happen just before and as we initiate a habit and just after and as we terminate a habit. In other words, it acts as a sort of marker for the habit execution, but not the execution of the habit per se. This is very important because task bracketing is what underlies whether or not a habit will be context dependent or not. 
whether or not it will be strong and likely to occur even if we didn't get a good night's sleep the night before, even if we're feeling distracted, even if we are not feeling like doing something emotionally, or if we are you know, completely overwhelmed by other events. If the neural circuits for task bracketing are deeply embedded in us, meaning they are very robust around a particular habit, well, then it's likely that we're going to go out for that zone two cardio no matter what, that we're going to brush our teeth no matter what. In fact, brushing our teeth is a pretty good example because for most people, even if you got a terrible night's sleep, even if everything in your life is going wrong, chances are, unless you're very depressed, if you're going to leave to work or even if you're not, that you're going to still carry out the behavior of brushing your teeth in the morning. I would hope so, actually. But you are probably less likely to perform particular habits that are not what you deem as necessary. But if you think about it, brushing your teeth, exercise, eating particular foods, maybe engaging socially in particular ways, you are the one that places any kind of value assessment on which ones are essential and which ones are negotiable. So task bracketing sets a a neural imprint, a kind of a fingerprint in your brain of this thing has to happen at this particular time of day, so much so that it's reflexive. 